I'd walk back to uh, to my house on Bourbon Street, and I would be sifting through this battlefield. And I had a friend at the time who was like, "Yo, we should do a, a taxi cab confessions type spinoff where we ask people to confess a deep dark secret." And we posted the next day, and so we we tried that, and it went viral on Instagram instantly. It was mostly incest stories. You know, people admitting to incest. I know it's a common Southern stereotype, but there's some truth to it. Uh, there was some murder confessions. That was pretty crazy. Uh, we never really posted any of those, but. How did you get people to confess? It's pretty easy. And New Orleans has a homicide solve rate of like 22%. So, I mean, m- most of the time, they'll they'll just tell you. I remember I was, I, was, I was walking down Bourbon and I asked this kid, I was like, what's your deepest, darkest secret? And he told me, he's like, I just smoked a dude in the Magnolia. It's a project housed in the third ward project development and they said i just smoked a dude in the magnolia playground for touching my sister molesting his sister and i was like what and he's like yeah look it up and i was like all right hold on and it was, it was like man found dead in central city playground like a, appeared to be homeless shot execution style so i told the kid i was like why'd you tell me that he's like man put that shit out there like i'm trying to go viral like tag me too oh wow. I, like, dude, I don't think you understand that even if you're a juvenile, he was probably 15. Yeah. You can go, you can get juvenile life in Louisiana for a homicide, even if it's, you know, justified. So uh, I just del- deleted the footage in front of him. I was like, I'm going to delete this footage. See that trash button? I'm hitting it right now. <laughs> Don't tell anyone that again. <laughs> and he was like, all right, I appreciate it. And he walked off. But it's the little, little moments like that. Like, <sighs> that I always Any, anything for the gram, I guess. Yeah. After a while, though, it became sort of uh, repetitive, you know, because there's only so many things that people can confess to that are they go viral you know and just oh so you were trying to see like what well i mean there's the incest one some people just say like i eat ass that was like every everyone said that or like mm-hmm. i cheated on someone or i've seen a surprising number of people on your channel say mention eating ass yeah <laughs> the way how, how seriously you said that will, yeah. will live in my head for the rest of my life <laughs> that's good yeah i, have I inter- want you i want to live in your head mm. saying that a lot of people mention eating ass. Yeah, a lot of people do mention that. Yeah. Also, that's kind of where I developed this magnetism for freestyle rapping. You know, everywhere I go, people rap. Not sure why. I mean, as a former rapper myself in middle school and for the first year of high school, I think that maybe like it takes one to know one, but everywhere I go, people start rapping. If you and me went outside of this podcast studio and walked around for five minutes, I yeah. could find somebody. <laughs> it's rapping. I can tell who raps or who can rap, who has eight bars in their head that they're ready to go. I think you also, there's something about you that gives them, creates the safe space yeah. to uh, perform their art. Yeah. that was. I mean, the Quarter Confession series was the first time you saw the suit. That's when the suit came out. Yeah. It was kind of like a Ron Burgundy, Eric Andre inspired type Where'd of Where'd you get thing. that suit? Goodwill. Goodwill. Yeah. Always. Wow, I was playing checkers. You're playing chess. Good I job. I mean, Goodwill has a surprising amount of identical gray suits for sale. Yeah, I've actually gotten suits at uh, at thrift stores before. They're great. Yeah, a lot of people donate suits, and I was going for oversized suits, which are the cheapest ones there. So yeah, it was like twelve bucks, twelve to twenty five dollars every time for the outfit. If I wanted to look super sophisticated, like like I'm from an, another era, mm-hmm. I would go to the thrift store. Yeah, because they're usually like this. There's like a, like the patterns they have. It's just like a more sophisticated suit, which is what you kind of picked out. It made you look ridiculous, but in the best kind of way. The tough part about quarter confessions for me is that everybody that was featured, for the most part, would more or less regret being a part of the show. Yeah. And that over time just gave me a bad feeling where I was like, you know what? I kind of feel like I am doing an ambush interview, especially because I'm presenting as so agreeable yet the intention is to make something funny. Yeah. And I get that that's what people do in the satire sphere. I'm sure Ali G and Bruno and Borat did the same thing. And I don't think it's unethical because that's all for the purposes of comedy. It is what it is. But for me, I wanted to do something different. Yeah, because there's an intimacy to confessing a thing. Right. And then you just don't really realize the implications of that. And the atmosphere of Bourbon Street is like, anything goes, like it's a free-spirited place, but... If you transport that energy digitally to a different place like Colorado, yeah, they might look at it and be like, oh, different man. place in time, like five yeah. years later, right? That same person has a family and stuff like this, and all of a sudden they're talking about eating ass. 
Right, exactly. And like, kids have to think about that. Or, yeah. you know, imagine if there's a video of your grandma or grandpa out there when he was a kid talking about eating ass. That's a horrible experience. <laughs> to, to discover that about your, you know, respected elder later in life, it's tough. I don't even know where to go with that. But uh, is, is the, literally the opening question was, tell me your deepest, darkest secret? Uh, yeah. You just come up to somebody like that? Yeah. How often do you get like a no? How often, what's the yes to no ratio? Well, the weird thing is like, we don't really um, extract answers from people like what makes a good interview is when they're ready to talk yeah. the more you have to talk and try to get an answer out of them yeah. it, it's just not a good vibe like so we kind of look for people who appear to be already ready to talk open body language like they seem confident and verbose and we approach them first there's a look we wouldn't approach a shy person and be like come on tell me no what about a person with pain in their eyes oh yeah we're interviewing them yeah so they're ready to talk they're just not like yeah there's different ways to be ready. Right. I see homeless people a lot and they always look fascinating. And the ones I've talked to are always fascinating. Yeah. We just did a video at the Vegas, in the Vegas tunnels, like trying to, obviously it got taken down by Fox, but whatever. We uh, I was going to make a joke that I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to help a lot of them by getting them IDs. And when I made the documentary, I had this idea that if I, it's a big, roadblock for them is getting identification without ids you can't check into a homeless shelter you can't do day labor you can't qualify for housing nothing so when, when we interviewed them they'd basically tell us if i had my id i wouldn't be here and so we said okay we're going to really help this time we're not just going to talk to them about their struggles we're going to actively go out and get them ids at the dmv so we did that and you know nothing it really changed in their life and we sat down with a recovery specialist who works directly with them day in and day out. And he explained to me that he's been trying to do the same thing I tried to do in a one week period for the past 10 years. And that they have deeper underlying traumas and pain that need to be dealt with far before they even take the steps to enter society as a housed person. That's a heavy truth right there. Breaking that shame cycle has to come first because you, you gotta think, right? Like I'm from a generation that romanticizes uh, vagrancy and homelessness to a certain extent, if it's called van life, or if it is done in a way that's sort of like Rolling Stone, Willie Nelson hit the road. People who are above 50, they feel really embarrassed to be in, in the spiral of homelessness. They feel like failures. A lot of them have kids who they weren't there for. That's not the kind of pain that can be dealt with by giving someone a, a tiny home. Yeah, It's a good step forward, but to, to for someone to really make a change, they have to want to change. And so it's how do you help someone and guide themselves in the right direction? And if you're too paternalistic and you use shame as a, as a method to get them to clean up, they're going to end up right where they started. Yeah. That's a tough truth to accept because a lot of people want a quick fix to things. And I don't blame people who go out and give bologna sandwiches out to the homeless. And each case is probably its own little puzzle. Each person is so complex. Now imagine yeah. drug abuse, what that does to the brain. Yeah. Trauma, childhood trauma. There's so much to unpack. And then just the uh the belief that they're the undesirables, that they're that they, they don't deserve to be a part of society because they failed a fundamental obligation like taking care of their kids. 